after the, the Buddha to be and practice austerities and realize he'd come to a dead end. He cast around in his mind for other possible ways of finding an end to suffering. And he remembered the time when he was young, when he spontaneously entered the first jhana. And he asked himself, could that be the way of awakening? And something inside said yes. But the big issue for him was that there was pleasure. It's interesting that the descriptions of the jhana don't say that it's endowed with pleasure, just as pleasure or equanimity, as the case may be. And then he asked himself why he was afraid of that pleasure. He realized there was nothing to be afraid of. It was blameless, both in the sense that it didn't harm anybody and it didn't harm his own mind. In other words, there are some pleasures where the mind gets intoxicated and it doesn't see things clearly because of the pleasure. But this was not a pleasure like that. This was a pleasure that actually allowed you to see your mind more clearly. So he took that as his path. Later on, when he was talking about the different factors of the path, he talked of right concentration as being the heart and the other factors as being supports. So this is the central factor of what we're doing right now trying to get the mind into right concentration. Of course, that involves right mindfulness, right effort, and all the other right factors of the path. But the pleasure of the path is important. It's what nourishes the path, keeps it going. One of the images in the canon is of a fortress where you've got soldiers who are fighting, protecting the fortress, and they need food, and concentration is their food. So this is what we're working on right now, is food for the path to keep it going. Because all the other factors of the path, if they don't have concentration, get dry very fast. And John Fuhn once made the comment that rapture that comes with the first and second jhanas is like a lubricant for the mind. The same with the, that an engine needs a lubricant. If it's lacking the lubricant, it just keeps running, 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 it's going to dry up and seize up. That'll be the end of the engine. So we practice concentration to keep the path going, to keep it nourished. And then we're able to do things with the mind that otherwise would be hard to do. Sense restraint being one of them. Now there are two aspects to sense restraint. One is there are certain things you don't look at, certain things you don't listen to. And John Swett made the comment one time that the eight precepts are basically training in sense restraint. In terms of the body, there's no sex at all. And you also don't lie on comfortable beds, sit on big, comfortable chairs. In terms of the, your eyes, you don't watch shows. In terms of your ears, you don't listen to music. In terms of your nose, you don't wear perfumes in other sense. In terms of your tongue, you don't eat afternoon. So each of the five senses gets treated with one of those extra precepts there. And that's the case where you actually are depriving yourself of something. But the aim being that if you stop looking for pleasure in these things, the mind is going to have to look for pleasure someplace. And that's what directs it to realizing that it really has to work on the concentration. It was going to be able to maintain this path. So in that way, sensory state puts you in a corner. It says, okay, you've got to get the mind to settle down and have a sense of well-being if you're going to find any happiness here at all. So that's one aspect. It actually is a kind of deprivation. You're saying no to certain things. And then there's another aspect of sense restraint, which is there to protect your concentration as you go through the day. You have to ask yourself, when you're looking at something, who's doing the looking? Are you doing the looking, or is greed doing the looking, or anger? In other words, what has sparked your interest in looking at something, or in listening, or any of the other ways of engaging the senses? So you're looking at where the impulse is coming from. Is it the kind of impulse you want to encourage? 
This is especially important now that the internet has come out and people have their smartphones and that are smarter than they are. They can get them to look in things and go from one window to the next window to the next and just waste huge amounts of time searching for a little bit of pleasure, getting a little bit of instant gratification. And so when you turn on your computer, you have to ask yourself, why am I turning it on? Who's turning it on? And the same with all the other devices. In addition to just ordinary, everyday engagement of the senses. The other, other question you have to ask is, when I look or listen, or whatever, to these things, or look and listen in these ways, what effect does it have on the mind? So you're looking at your sensory engagement as a causal process. Where is it coming from? Where is it going? And you find that looking in certain ways is bad for your concentration or helps eat away at any sense of well-being inside. You've got to look or listen in a different way. In some cases, this means not looking or listening at all to certain things. But in other cases, it means looking at it from a different angle. As John Lee says, you have to be a person with two eyes. If you see something that gives rise to desire, well, look at the other side. That's not so desirable. Freud has a weird way of looking at things. He says our basic desire is for sex. And if that desire gets frustrated, then we go looking for other things. Well, the basic desire actually is the desire for pleasure. And the Buddha takes advantage of that in his path. On the one hand, you've got the pleasure of jhana, and then you look at the pleasures that come from the senses and sensual enjoyment and, and sexual activity. And you realize that it's not really all that pleasant. It has its bad side as well. The mind wants pleasure more than wants anything else. This is why even our drive for survival is dependent on finding pleasure in life. When people find no more pleasure in life at all, they want to die. That shows where our real drive is. It's for pleasure. So in one case, you sublimate the drive. You actually become more discerning in how you're going to look for pleasure. So much of our lives is driven by the desire for pleasure. And yet we very rarely sit down and think it through. What really is pleasant for us? What really does give satisfaction? So you have to learn how to see the desire for pleasure as basic, but then you want to look for a pleasure that really is pleasure all the way through, has no drawbacks, either now or on in the future. And that's when you have to focus on the pleasures of the path. So when you're looking at things and you find that you look at something that has a pleasant side, but it's going to pull you away from your, the path, you've got, to look, you've got to look for its bad side as well. Or if there are things that get you angry, you have to look for the good side, too. Or if you find there are people who make you angry, they may not have any good side at all. As the Buddha said, you have to have pity on them. You have to think of the Buddha's image of the world after gained awakening. Everybody's on fire. You think about it. We go for a pleasure, and it's, it goes away as, as it's coming. And as soon as we focus on something, as the Buddha said, you try to base your happiness on something, and it's already become otherwise something than what it was. It slips away, slips away. Time just keeps going so fast, and there's no way you can call it back, no way you can stop it. It's like we're on fire. And so when you see somebody that you really don't like, remember, okay, that person is on fire, as the Buddha said. They're suffering. So if it's hard to find a good side to their, their character, a good side to their behavior, at the very least, remind yourself they're suffering. So you can get a little bit of sympathy for them. And that way you rise up above the common back and forth of liking people who do nice things to you and disliking people who do bad things to you. Or in the Buddha's analysis, what he calls love that comes from love, love that comes from hate, hate that comes from love, hate that comes from hate. You love somebody, someone else does nice, something nice to that person, but you're going to love the second person. 
You love somebody, somebody does something nasty to that person. Well, you're going to hate the second person. There's somebody you hate, and somebody else does nasty things to them. You're going to love that person. There's somebody you hate, and somebody does nice things to that person. You're going to hate the second person. It's all really very arbitrary and very unreliable. So we develop an attitude of true compassion. We can rise up above those back, back and forth exchanges that go up and down with hate and love. This way, sense restraint raises us up above our ordinary concerns, our ordinary likes and dislikes, reminding us, ourselves that true happiness is not going to be found out there in the five senses. It's going to be found inside, first through developing the sixth sense, i.e. the sense of the mind, and then finding something that goes beyond the senses altogether. So the practice of sense restraint does require some deprivation of some things, but it's for the purpose of channeling your desire for happiness in the right direction. And then it becomes a matter of how you look, how you listen, and so forth. Which impulses in the mind to look and listen are ones that really should be followed and which ones should not. And you provide the antidote. If you find that lust is doing the looking, while well, you do contemplation of the body. Anger is doing the looking, you develop goodwill. It's by bringing yourself into balance like this, you can begin to rise above our ordinary groping around, looking for whatever pleasure comes our way, and taking our, desi <clears throat> taking our desire for pleasure and making something higher out of it, something noble. As the Buddha said, if you look for happiness in things that are going to pass away, subject to aging, illness, and death, it's, it's an ignoble search. But if you look for happiness in things that don't age, grow ill, or die, that search, even though it's motivated by the desire for pleasure, is noble. So the, the pleasure principle can be noble. If you develop it in the right direction, 